Jonathan Haidt is a moral psychologist. He teaches at New York University. Most of his research is based on how our brains come to make decisions, how they're shaped to take on particular moral behaviors, and really what factors go into defining a particular behavior as moral to begin with. The central thesis of both of Haidt's books, The uh, Happiness Hypothesis and The Righteous Mind, is that human beings are not logical creatures, rational creatures, who with just the right amount of information will then make correct moral decisions. And neither are we slaves to our subconscious and to our emotions alone. Haidt draws on this image to talk about the mind and the will. He talks about them like an elephant and a rider. The elephant is our emotional self, our intuition, the deep-seated tugs of the heart formed by God's design in human evolution and cultural expression. It is powerful and large. The rider, though, is more our conscious thought. And while not more powerful than the elephant, the rider, through careful training, can steer the will and desire in slightly different directions. But how do we train the rider and guide the elephant in these moral directions. Haidt discusses one way that happens in his book, The Righteous Mind, in a chapter he calls, Religion is a Team Sport. In that chapter, he talks about a study conducted by Robert Putnam and David Campbell. These two researchers sent out surveys to people asking them questions about their religious beliefs and their religious practices. The survey included questions like, do you believe in hell? Do you believe that we will have to give an accounting of our life before God when we die? Or things like, do you pray daily? How often do you read scripture? And then the researchers took the answers to the survey and they compared it with the uh, explicit practices of generosity of the respondents, how the people used their time and how they gave of their money to other people. And here's how Haidt summarizes their findings. Whether you believe in hell, whether you pray daily, whether you are a Catholic, Protestant, Jew, or Mormon, none of these things correlated with generosity. The only thing that was reliably and powerfully associated with the moral benefits of religion was how enmeshed people were in relationships with their co-religionists. It's the friendships and group activities carried out within a moral matrix that emphasizes selflessness. That's what brings out the best in people. Beliefs and personal practices do far less to nudge the elephant towards moral decision-making than do communal activities that create a shared moral matrix based on deeds and actions of selflessness. What this research shows then is the more that you come to worship, recite the creed, sing the doxology, confess your sins, pass the offering plate, celebrate the Eucharist, the more generous you become with sharing your resources. Now, it's not a formula you can follow. It's not like Weight Watchers where you accumulate points and somehow you lose the weight you're looking to lose. It's more about a reorientation of the heart. So let me use a, uh, a musical example. During this time of quarantine, I have tried to fill my time by practicing the piano more. And so I pulled out this book of Bach inventions that I have, I don't like Bach inventions, the counterpoint, your hands moving in different directions quickly at the same time, the precision that's required. I'd much rather play romantic music where I can lay real heavy on the damper pedal and mush up all the sound with big arpeggios and runs that mask my mistakes and how you can kind of bend the tempo in romantic music to get through the difficult parts without anybody knowing that's why you're doing that. You're not allowed to fudge that way when you play Bach. I can remember when I was taking piano lessons and would work on a Bach piece, 
after I was finished, my piano teacher would say, that was good, Andrew, but you need to be sure and play the notes that Bach wrote and not the notes that Andrew wishes Bach had written. So, I'm working on Bach invention number one in C major. And I can't get all the runs and trills right to save my life. And do you know the main reason I can't? It's in part because I haven't been playing Bach for the last 15 years, but it's also because I don't practice my scales. Piano playing requires your fingers to be strong, and the way you strengthen your finger muscles and your brain's ability to move your two hands in different ways at the same time, it is to drill scales. Pianists who practice their scales regularly, you've heard too in recent weeks in Dean Vance and Austin France, they're able to pick up a piece of box music and play it much more easily than I can in these days. And so just as I want to get better at playing Bach, but that takes practicing my scales, this gives us a picture too of what it takes for us to capture, to live by a vision of a moral life of integrity, something that we've conjured up in our own mind, something God's laid on our heart, something that we've seen in someone else that we admire. We desire to live this moral integrated life so badly, just like I want to be able to open my piano bench, pull out a book of Bach inventions, and play them all perfectly. I want a life of meaning and purpose, we say. I want to live by kindness and grace, I long for the peace of Christ to rule in my heart. But that vision cannot take root in us and lead to our transformation unless we are practicing our scales. And even sociological research not conducted by some religious institution tells us time and time again that communal participation in a religious community is the most effective way to shape our hearts and our lives. The moral matrix shaped by a way of selflessness. That's what Paul is talking about when he writes to the Thessalonians the moral matrix that is shaped by their ritual practice together. He encourages the Thessalonians to stand firm and hold fast to the traditions he has taught them. Now, we're not entirely sure what those traditions are, but we can surmise from Paul's other letters and early Christian practice what some of them were. Principally, it was the gathering of the community on the day of resurrection, the first day of the week, on Sunday for worship. And that worship time would have had something like a sermon. A sermon comes out of the practices of the Jewish synagogue where a rabbi, a teacher, would expound and illumine a piece of sacred scripture. So early Christian worship would have included a sermon. There would have also been a weekly celebration of the Eucharist or communion or the Lord's Supper Paul speaks of the baptismal celebrations of new Christians and some kind of greeting of one another. Paul talks about sharing a holy kiss in some of his letters. In other places in his letters, Paul quotes lyrics from early Christian hymns. So we assume that Christian worship gatherings included singing and then prayers for one another and for the world. Paul talks repeatedly, too, about an offering of the money of the people for the needs of the poor. These are all documented traditions that are discussed in the early letters of Paul and in the earliest stories of the Christian church. And generation after generation, they're repeated. And that may be one of the greatest challenges right now for us as Christian people when we are in this time of absence. It's hard to keep practicing our scales when we are physically distanced from one another. Singing a hymn in our living room in our pajamas just isn't the same as holding the hymnal, hearing the organ fill the room, the ground shaking beneath our feet, the voices of those behind us holding us up. 
watching slides of announcements come through during the prelude or while the opportunities for discipleship are being discussed just isn't the same as gazing upon a stained glass window, losing ourselves in the colors and the forms and the stories of Jesus, finding ourselves enveloped by that story and our own place within that sacred tale. It's the transcendence we experience in the vaulted ceiling, the light of Christ being brought down the center aisle by the acolyte, the funny little note that we write in the friendship pad to pass down to our neighbor. All part of our collective experience that shapes our moral lives. We were supposed to baptize Sophie Heddleston the Sunday after Easter, and we had to delay that sacrament. Now, baptism, we know, celebrates the free grace of God that is showered upon the person it is God cleansing the child. It is God's initiative. But the vows and the promises, they belong to us all. It's not a private act. It's a communal one. It's welcoming this baby into our collective witness and our ritual life so that she can learn the scales of her faith and by her life begin to sing beautiful symphonies to her God. Without us being able to affirm we do and we will, the sacrament loses its power. So we're in week 10 now of doing this online worship thing. And as you know, we still do it at 11 a.m. here in the sacred space with music and liturgy, even with communion, because we want to keep our people in these sacred rhythms, these rituals of the faith, to keep us practicing our scales together as a church. And I imagine somewhere in these 10 weeks, these words have crossed your lips or at least crossed your mind. Man, you know, it is kind of nice not having to wrestle the kids into their clothes and load everybody in the car and everybody be in a huff and angry at one another so that we can get to church on time. Hey, look, I got all my laundry folded and put away during the sermon. You know, we were preoccupied today at 11 o'clock, so it was so nice that we could just log into YouTube at 2 o'clock and worship when it was more convenient for us. And hear me out. That's fine. It's a weird time. And the fact that you are staying connected to your Christian community at all is a beautiful and wonderful thing. But I also hope that some part of you is longing for our traditions. From a choir procession to front steps full of children to sharing of bread and cup to giving of our offerings, the smell of the oak and cedar wood in the sanctuary, the crease of the bulletin, the faces that greet you, lingering in the gathering area, walking out through the columbarium to greet the saints, leaving the cool building to enter the hot car with the music or a word or a prayer still playing out in your heart in ways you comprehend and in ways you don't quite understand finding that insert about the mission project in your purse on Tuesday, attending a committee meeting, midweek communion, centering prayer, filling hunger bags, sharing a meal, going to choir rehearsal, making photocopies, just popping in the office to see what's going on and to say hello to the staff, to the hearing of our voices ringing out to the heavens in harmony, our great amen, amen means may it be so. We conclude our worship each Just because we can't do these things in that way right now, I want to implore you not to forget how they shape us. Keep longing for them once more. Keep 
looking eagerly for that day in the future when once again we can gather together because it is these rituals, it is these traditions. They are what bring out the best in us. These scales of our faith enable from us performances then of both the most challenging and the most beautiful expressions of God's grace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.